Olga Cavalli, a long time ICANN member, been involved in ICANN for about 12 years. Olga, how do you describe the multi-stakeholder model to people who are completely unfamiliar with it? Well, to describe this model, you have to understand the impact of technology in our lives, in society, in governments. Nothing can be done by only a single stakeholder. Governments need to understand what happens with private sector, private companies, uh, with chambers that associate uh, different companies, also civil society is important to be heard, academy, so the different parts of the society and the economy are so impacted by, by internet and, and technology that you cannot solve any problem and you cannot understand its impact if you just look at it from only one perspective. So this is the, the beauty and the challenge of the multi-stakeholder model. You have to hear all stakeholders, you have to talk to them, you have to have a dialogue, and if possible, we have to find ways to work together. One thing that's always fascinated me about the multi-stakeholder model, when ICANN was developed back in 1998, this was pretty unusual. I mean, still unusual, yeah. but particularly so then. And the idea of having all these various stakeholders included in the process, pretty unusual now, but especially then, right? It was unusual then, and let me tell you, I've been going through this uh, space of dialogue and participation through all these years, and it's still unusual, especially for, for, for governments who are more used to multilateral conversations and participation spaces like United Nations or that type of interna in international governmental organizations, which is okay because they have their own same level dialogue, I would sure. say. But um, it's important that they understand that the only way to understand and solve the impact of some, some challenges that uh, technology brings is if you, if you really have a multi-stakeholder space for dialogue and for, for trying to solve this problem. Say, for example, cybersecurity, privacy challenges, human rights related with the use of technology, the impact of the IT technology in, in the media, in the communications. The government cannot solve that alone. I, for example, I remember that big strike from taxis in Buenos Aires when Uber was started to, mm -hmm. to appear in, into our city. Big city, a lot of taxis there. And then the people thought it was a problem from caused by the internet. And I, many people called me and I say, why? It's a problem of, it's a transport problem. It's a problem of, of to, to be taken from the transport perspective. But it was driven by the use of technology, by the use of internet. So they were blaming the technology. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the first thing that they did was uh, trying to put down Uber.com, which is a nonsense because you can copy very easily to other. And it, and it also, it, it's, a, it's a website, not, not, uh, not established in Argentina. So that kind of things, you can only solve them if all, all the parties are sitting together and right. try to understand the impact and the challenges. The, the benefits of the multi-stakeholder model are obvious. I mean, it, it, everybody coming together, inclusion, it sounds great, it sounds marvelous. The reality is it's hard to make it work, right? Yeah. Um, there is one thing that when, when you analyze the multi-stakeholder model you have to have in mind is that some stakeholders have some responsibilities which cannot be denied or neglected. For example, governments are the ones to make the law enforcement at the national level within their boundaries. Also, there are some international treaties that governments have agreed to and those are binding into our law, into their laws. So that stakeholder is somehow, I don't want to say different because people don't like that and they tell me that I, I favor governments, which is not true, but you have to realize the role of each of the stakeholders and try to understand which is their responsibility. So if you're a president of a country or, a, or, or you're um, a diplomatic or you are a, a owner of a company, the roles are different. It's not that they are not relevant, both are relevant, but it's not different. So trying to consile them, that's a challenge, not easy. Is it a challenge? Uh, governments, this is a weird, unusual sort of model for governments, which are, have their own way of, of dealing with issues, coming to consensus. All of a sudden, they have a voice equal to other stakeholders. 
business and, and so on and so forth. Is it hard for governments to get used to the multi-stakeholder model? What it's hard for governments is to, to get away from established uh, rules mm -hmm. and ways of interacting. But that's difficult, isn't it? Extremely difficult. Presidents sit with presidents. They don't sit with other people. <laughs> um, vice presidents sit with vice presidents and congressmen sit with... So that level of understanding of what that's, that means for governmental uh, officials is something that the multi-stakeholder model has to have in mind. So you will see, for example, next meeting in Barcelona, you will have this high-level meeting of, for the GAC, for the Governmental Advisory Committee. I think that's a good idea of bringing high-level officials into this environment to make them understand being more close, because usually those of us who participate are more technicians or more, more uh, uh, people who are on the field every right. day. And, and high-level officials sometimes they don't have time because their agendas are quite complicated. And this is a long meeting, like three, four days for them is not possible. So it's good that, that these spaces are open. Also in the Internet Governance Forum, in the IGF, they have created this high-level meeting at the beginning to bring high-level officials from government. It will take some time. Some governments have, have implemented this with, with quite success. I would say that Brazil has uh, has implemented this um, CGI Comité Gestor da Internet, uh, in, um, com comité, how, how do I translate that? Uh, comité, the, the committee that uh, manages the internet, something mm -hmm. like that in Portuguese. And they brought all parties together, all stakeholders there. And the government has a seat, the academia, private sector. So for them, it's working for a long time and they there they decide and they analyze things related with the impact of the internet. It, it sounds like the challenges are tremendous. I mean, it works in spite of these tremendous challenges. We talked about one, which is governments have a certain way of thinking about these things. But on the other hand, we're dealing with a lot of people involved in technology, many of whom are not used to interacting with people like government officials or business people. So it's difficult for all parties, I would guess, because they're coming at this from different positions, right? Yes, because also they have different knowledge and uh -huh. the dialogue, it's different. And way to dialogue. Way, exactly. The way to dialogue with a technical expert is not the, the same one that you would have with someone from government. Also, what you have to have in mind is that this jurisdiction issue is not the same a non-for-profit organization established in, in a certain country, which is what ICANN is, mm -hmm. than uh, United Nations, which is uh, an, an international organization based on an international treaty, which is binding for the government. So from a, the legal, international legal point of view, there are some things that you cannot deny and you have yeah. to have in mind when you're a government. It's, it's interesting because someone once described to me, they said, I can basically works because people buy into the idea that it should work, that it needs to work. By definition, that seems like such an abstract philosophy for governments to grasp because of what you just mentioned. They're used to treaties, they're used to signed accords, memos of understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, that's the challenge, but I think that governments are understanding slowly but surely that uh, a dialogue and interaction with other with other stakeholders are the only way to solve some problems. For example, I think that today we have this cyber security and, and we have this experience of the European uh, regulations about privacy. It's for Europeans, but it impacts all, all over the world because the internet is mm -hmm. interconnecting all of us. So if you don't understand, and also the companies having so much data about us um, and the social media, but does that ever work to an advantage? Because, uh, you know, right now uh, we have GDPR in, in Europe. Does that actually drive a curiosity or a willingness to understand an organization like ICANN? For sure. That's, uh, it drives the curiosity about what privacy means first, mm -hmm. which are the rules of privacy in your own country, in your own society, and also it, it it, it brings the people to think about it, also the governments to think about the regulations they have at the local level, 
and to see what's the impact for, a, for an organization like ICANN that, has, that manages the domain name system that is basically a coordination of different databases spread all over the world. So with personal data and, and relevant data for privacy. So yeah, it's, it's a process. The thing is that the process is always dynamic and it's always changing. Mm -hmm. So once you get acquainted to something, then it's rapidly evolves. <laughs> evolves quickly. So this is, this is one of the challenges, the permanent change. When you first mention, when you're talking to a group, because I know that you talk to a lot of different groups, when you talk to a group and you first mention the multi-stakeholder model, have they heard of it? Do they get it? They get it, especially now, because it's the only way to solve some, some things that we face today. I, I think that the most clear example is cybersecurity. You, if you don't understand how, the, for example, the internet service provider works and how people are handling their access to the internet and, and how people are using their data, you cannot solve the problem. And in spite of the fact that governments may have a lot of laws and regulations and tools, if you don't educate your people, if you don't understand what the companies are doing, then you won't solve the problem. So yeah. that's the only way is to sit all together and talk. So that's the beauty of the multi-stakeholder model. I mean, it's really, a, and you hit the nail on the head, I want, to, I want to build on that point. It's really about bringing people together to talk. Yes, that's the issue, which uh, it's not always easy, yeah. but that's as, as always is. No? You, you see the Congress talking and you have the same problem, try to, uh, to prepare for a law, it's, it's difficult, but it's not insurmountable. It's not insurmountable, and it's a way. It's a good way to solve problems and go ahead. Let me ask you about one other thing. You're unique in that you are a woman, in typically in a field in the ICT world where women are typically underrepresented. Has that been a challenge for you when you have come up through the ranks when you when you are involved in this sphere? I would say that it was a challenge when I started my career. Mm -hmm. I am an electronic and electric engineer. I, when, I, when I studied, we were very few women in university. There are still very few women studying electronic engineering today. Many other women are perhaps going through uh, systems and other careers. I think it has been a challenge. I, I could luckily always work in what I studied, and uh, I don't think it was a challenge within ICANN. I think, uh, at, at the contrary, I can found in myself a way to promote some gender balance. Um, it's getting I, better. Uh, no. No? Not? <laughs> no. no Why? The, uh, well, with a friend of mine, she was a board member, Asha Hemrajani. She's not a board member anymore. We started to talk about how could we analyze the reasons that women were not so many in leadership positions. In the great group, I think that's okay. Yeah. But um, board, member, board members or leadership positions, some leadership positions in ICANN. And uh, we, we, we organized some dialogue spaces through several ICANN meetings. And what, what we found, one of the things that happened is that women don't show up. For example, you make a call for non-com, the non-com makes a call for board members. Very few women apply. There are reasons for that. Women usually have less time. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, still women at home, we have to face the challenge of our mother getting old, which is what happens with me now. My kids are, are not, don't need me more now because they are in their 20s, but now my mother is in her 80s. As all the kids are small and you need that more time at home. So you have less time and don't, you don't show up in those, in those calls for participation. And if you don't show up, you can never be selected. That's one point. And then, um, well, there is this, uh, it's difficult sometimes to select women because they have perhaps gone through less experience because of this same issue. So I think there is some way to go uh, on. I've been thinking about something which is also controversial when I talk about it, which is quotas. Should we have quotas for the I can board, for example, leadership position for spark, the non-com. Has to spark a lot of debate, right? Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm just trying to find reactions. And uh, it worked in Argentina in the Congress. It worked quite well. Immediately, many people tell me, well, 
asked, but maybe the women you select because of the quota are not good. And I say, well, not all the men selected are always good. Sometimes yeah. you select a candidate and it's not good. It's right. whether Regardless it's, of what, it's exactly. So that's part of the general um, probability that, that you can fail or not. So that's something we have analyzed. I think it's not solved. If you look at the boards of several orga um, uh, technology organizations, I'm a board member of ISOC. We are three women and we will be only two since next week because one of the women are leaving and it has been replaced by a man. I was part of the non-con group that selected the new members and we had only six applications for women and more than 30 for men. Wow. So the, you see that the, that's one of the problems. So that's a, it's, it's not only a man problem, it's, a, it's also women also applying for that. You had mentioned Argentina as, as the governmental advisory committee rep for Argentina, which you have been, how is the, how is the multi-stakeholder model viewed in Argentina? Well, it's, it's well received. Argentina supports the multi-stakeholder model. We, uh, we tried sometimes to organize kind of uh, the way that Brazil has done uh, as a formal group, but it, I would say it works informally. So what I do when I go back home, then I talk with other ministries and, and distribute documents. So it's informally organized. Through associations and through uh, smaller conversations, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, we sometimes we organize meetings at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the meetings are organized by other ministry and we go there. So it's informally happening. We, we used to have one formally established by governmental resolutions that was in 2014. Uh, well, the, the, then it has been changed, but informally, yes, it works. And Argentina supports the multi-stakeholder model in, uh, as, as a concept. What are some of the milestones when you think of the multi-stakeholder model and I can? What do you think of as some of the major milestones over the years? I think that one example of, um, with its failures and some things to be fixed, the, the IANA transition was I think was the first big multi-stakeholder thing we have done so far. Because it was first the, um, the meeting we had in Sao Paulo, the Net Mundial, mm -hmm. that was multi-stakeholder, but in my honest opinion it was short, it was only three days, and the document was produced during that three days in a multi-stakeholder environment, it was kind of short. This document that we produced, all these changes in the bylaws and all what happened after the IANA transition, was a long process, was truly multi-stakeholder. Not easy perhaps for, for governments to really get involved in, but it worked. It worked and I think it has been good for the organization. ICANN is, is quite interesting because you have one uh, supporting organization which is multi-stakeholder itself, which is the GNSO. The GNSO has all the different stakeholders inside. You have the registries, the registrars, the ISP, the intellectual property, you have the civil society, and I'm maybe forgetting someone. And then outside that uh, supporting organization, which is the GNSO, then you have the ALAG, you have the... Um, so multi-stakeholder within multi-stakeholder. That's the point. So interaction in, in between these parties is quite special. It's difficult to understand ICANN. I, I usually tell my students when when they come for the first time to ICANN meeting, I say, don't worry, you won't understand anything, but that's normal, don't, don't panic, come again, take your time. It, it takes a time to understand how all these parts interact in between and the dynamics. But the GNSO is very interesting. This is why when I was doing my PhD, I was selected by the NONCOM to be a GNSO uh, council member, and I was vice chair of the GNSO. And I learned so much because there you have the interaction of the parties that really run ICANN, which is registries, registrars, and then the intellectual property, which is very strong uh, in relation with domain names. And then you have the civil society, and, and then you have uh, the, the ISPs who, who are very technical oriented. So that interaction in the GNSO is, I would say, it's, the, it's really the core of ICANN. And then they have to interact with the, with the GAC, it's only governments, and the ALAG. You know, Olga, as I hear you talk about it, it's kind of amazing that there's ever consensus reached that something happens. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it happens, you see. Uh, it happened with the IANA transition. Not easy. We had some difficult times, especially when, when trying the governments to be 
considered when we when we had some challenges about the considering the GAC advice and other things, but finally we managed to to move forward the and not to block the idea was not to block the process, but to make our concerns be inherent. Sure, the most popular line that I heard uh, after the transition was accomplished was it this is a validation of the multi-stakeholder model. Would you accept, is that accurate? It is, because also multilateral has its own challenges and, 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 and deficiencies. So you see, perfection is something that we want to achieve, but we have to live with some other stages in between. So yeah. What's the single biggest problem with the model, bringing all these in entities together? What's the single biggest problem? Uh, for me, it's understanding the role of each stakeholder, which is not the same. And by that, you mean each stakeholder has to understand the role of the other stakeholders? You cannot forget the role of a government trying to uh, enforce the law at a national level. That's, that's something that the government was uh, the, 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 the people gave the government that, that mandate. So that, that is something that you cannot avoid. So you have to interact in, with the government in a way that they can get what, what, what the private sector and the civil society and the, the electoral property people say and help them get that information into the laws, into the regulations. That's, that's I think, is the biggest challenge. In my country, uh, in the U.S. Congress, there is always a criticism that lobbyists, people representing various stakeholders, if you will, various interests, are always competing with one another for the attention of the legislators. And that if anything, it leads to a lack of understanding of the other interests. Would that be a similar concern with the multi-stakeholder model? Somehow, yes. It's it's life. You see, <laughs> that's that's it's that's, natural. That's, as what you're it's saying. natural. It's it's somehow the the challenge of democracy. Um, you don't want one dictator. You want interaction, and that is not easy. That it it takes to some discussions, to debate, to under sometimes the prevalence of one vision and then the other one. This is why you have elections, and this is why you change. Uh, with with democracy, and I think multi-stakeholders somehow is the same. You you have to be tolerant. You have to understand that sometimes one one is one vision is more prevalent than the other, but that may change with time. If if you if the society sees that that's not good, that that may change. If the rules are there, and the governance of the system is 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 maintained and and it's kind of healthy, that will change. So it's it's always a process. What I seem to be hearing you say is it's tough. It, it's difficult to make it work, but at the end of the day, it's still the best way. Yes, I heard, I, I'm not a specialist in, in public policy, in I would say politics, but I've heard that democracy has its challenges and its problems, that is the best thing that we have now. I would say the same with multi-stakeholders. It it's, has its, its, its deficiencies, you, maybe you can criticize this, but it's the only way that all stakeholders can sit together and try to understand what is happening with technology, that it's impacting everything. Because you cannot live your life with, with, with access, and, and those who are not included are totally out of many things. Uh, it was not the same like 15 or 20 years ago, but today, imagine someone that has no internet access, cannot go to the bank, cannot send an email, cannot watch the games online. So their lives are totally out of a system that it's really has challenges, but it's for me, it's fantastic. It's almost, it almost sounds like it's a necessity that it work it, because it's needed. It's needed and it's there. It's, it has impacted our life. Olga Cavalli, thank you very much for taking the time you're, to talk you're, to us. You're very kind. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.